Hi. Um, so this is both a, a mini talk and a survey talk. Uh, so I'm going to give the caveat that uh, I, with the interest of time, I'm going to basically run my mouth for hopefully 20 minutes and really zoom through a lot of material. Um, I don't expect everyone to understand uh, everything. Maybe uh, a number of you don't even uh, uh, understand what a derivative is. Um, but I hope that some of you will understand some things, um, or, or all of you will understand some things. And um, uh, it, uh, I can't guarantee there will be questions at the end, but I, at the very least, I'll be available afterwards if you can pick out a particular thing that interests you. Um, I'll try to explain it, and if I, if I can't explain it, I can certainly point you to uh, the right uh, thing to read uh, so that you, you will understand it. So um, uh, without uh, um, further ado, uh, probably the first thing a lot of you are wondering is, what is automatic differentiation, right? I better explain that before I go into uh, the research history of it. Um, and uh, it's easier to under, e easiest to start with what it's not. Uh, the two most popular um, uh, um, forms of, of uh, calculating derivatives are symbolic differentiation, like you're used to with uh, MATLAB and other computer algebra systems. Um, and these are basically uh, just automating how you would do calculus by hand, right? Uh, you're putting things in with traditional uh, notation like you learned in high school. And it's, uh, it's, output, it's basically just very quickly, um, uh, much faster than you could uh, doing calculations, rearranging symbols, and, and then uh, returning a value. Um, and uh, you know the the downside. It, the upsides are it's very easy to use. The downsides are it, it, it's quite slow, uh, too slow to use it in production. But generally, if you just have to do something once, you know, per personally, I'll I'll use Wolfram Alpha if I want to just check that I'm right or find the answer to um, to a computation very quickly. Um, but it's uh, you know it, it's not. Uh, something that you could put in production. Also, um, very often, we don't want just the, the value of a derivative at a certain point. We want actually the function of a derivative returned. And when you get that out of something like, like, like MATLAB or Mathematica, um, you just get a, another um, equation with, with uh, all, all of the, the subscripts and, and the, the notation that you're used to. And at a certain point, they get to be uh, totally illegible and, and just hairier and hairier equations. All you do is feed them back into MATLAB, and you know, uh, eventually it's going to give you, probably give you a wrong answer, because uh, uh, which is, very frankly, I know from experience, computer algebra systems are very difficult to, to program. Um, then the, the other method is numerical approximation, uh, or what you might uh, hear referred to as uh, numeric methods. Um, these are things, you know, uh, stemming from Lagrangian interpolation and such, um, and uh, um, th there's, uh, they're assumed to be very fast. Um, uh, and obviously, they're fundamentally inexact. They're approximations. Um, I would challenge the assumption that they're uh, that they're fast because, of course, um, the more you care about precision, you're essentially oscillating a value around a given point, right? And 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 you have to to, to define how precise you want it to be. The more precise you want it to be, the the slower it is. So um, the idea that it's fast, yeah, it's it's fast to get an extremely inexact answer. If you want the one that's exact enough for for your purposes, it it might actually turn out to be quite slow. Um, so, but what is Symbolic. Uh, what, what, what is automatic differentiation? Uh, it w I think it's best to proceed with an example. So here you can see in, in, in Haskell, um, in my li my little uh, 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 fake GHCI prompt here, um, this is uh, just calculating the uh, f f uh, the first five terms of the Taylor series uh, for sine and cosine, or actually the the Maclaurin series is the Taylor series at zero, and um, it, it's a little bit t difficult to see because of uh, Haskell's notation of using uh, um, a um, a quotation instead of a, a what you're uh, for rationals instead of a, um, a forward slash, but you, you, anyone who's familiar with Taylor series can clearly see that this is uh, this is correct. Uh, it's the, the you know the inverse uh, w with the variables elided. It's the inverse factorial um, uh, uh, alternating between sine and cosine, and with the signs themselves alternating. Um, but what I would really look at is the definition of of these functions up there of sine and cosine, and uh, I think. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it, if you're, you should really squint at them, and, and, and if you, uh, I, th I think if you just look at them as mundane and don't, don't feel nothing, it's like maybe you have like a part of you dead inside. 
you know, because I, I, I look at these and, and, and knowing what's going on, I, I see this as immensely beautiful. And I think, you know, uh, chances are most of you don't know what's going on. And I would really be, if I, I were you wondering, how the hell is this even working, right? I mean, look at the, the definition for sine is the, the, the integral of cosine, right? And, 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 and so they're, they're mutually recursive. And the definition for cosine is 1 minus the integral of sine. It, it, it's literally that simple. And then you get exact results com coming out in an infinite series here. So um, I would really wonder, you know, like, how does this work? And, and so it, 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 um, uh, in the hacker jargon file, um, they refer to uh, deep magic. Um, and, 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 and more importantly, I think, differentiate between deep magic and black magic. So there are all these tricks that we have. <laughs> it, it's, that's in, and that may be why I'm wearing a cape today to present this. <laughs> Um, so, but uh, yeah, there are all these tricks, right, that we have passed along. Uh, that that, that if, if you're a programmer, that 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 you maybe you didn't learn formally, but that you know, uh, especially things like bit shifting, that just to get passed along through the time. And um, I think the differentiation that they draw is that deep magic is something that uh, it's a trick that has a, a good explanation for how it works, right? And and, and black magic is, is just sort of a hack that that um, that. You know, it, it just it it just works. You you might use it without even understanding how it works. Um, and and it, it to me is kind of the definition of, of of a hack. That's it's not really as elegant. And so 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 my 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 initial argument in the first part of this talk is that uh, automatic differentiation is deep magic, and that there's quite it's not a coincidence that that uh, those two functions I showed you, those two mutually recursive functions, um, uh, work. Um, and uh, so. First of all, some 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 uh, uh, background for motivation as to why people would even want to do such a thing. Uh, I have to go into the operational calculus. You may have seen um, some things that look like this before. Um, and basically, since uh, Leibniz, uh, mathematicians were constantly trying to develop new and better uh, notation for calculus, right? Uh, and getting away from these ugly subscript-filled uh, uh, monstrosities that that we were tortured with in high school calculus, uh, and uh, have, you know led to this. Uh, um, uh, anti-intellectualism towards math that we have uh, in the United States here now. Um, and so, I mean, it, 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 if you look very clearly here, right, like say, um, uh, the, you know, the, the um, um, div, right, that the, you know, looks like a function that you'd apply, right, in, in programming, and then, you know, you have uh, the, the, the ugly subscript uh, filled side of it for, on the far right, but in the middle you have it, it's just a, a multiplication operator, right? And, and so this is just like operator overloading in the 19th century before computers, right? It's exactly like operator overloading in C++ or Haskell, and, um, or, or, or if you're unfortunate enough to work in a language where they've decided that we, as programmers, can't be trusted with operator overloading, um, Java. Um, so, um, uh, and, and so this became a big deal mainly uh, in, in, in the late uh, 19th century in mathematical physics. Because if you think about it, you're working with Jacobians, Hessians, and you're working with so many um, derivatives uh, that it really just becomes sort of impossible to represent uh, using you know, tr that uh, really um, verbose traditional notation. So it really makes sense to want to have to to, to want to be able to um, you know just say uh, uh, div curl grade um, uh, when you have you know giant matrices potentially like filled with you know even up to uh, second order partials. Um, and so this is mainly associated with Oliver Heaviside, the um, the step function guy. If you know him from that, um, but as early as you know, George Boole um, uh, was working on this, and, uh, and Norbert Wiener uh, gave a great survey of it in the, in, uh, the uh, 20th century. Um, and uh, as far as computation goes, uh, Charles Babbage is mostly known for the uh, analytic engine, right? Um, but 15 in the years earlier, and, and that was a general purpose computer, 15 years earlier than that, he described the difference engine. This is actually a photo of it in, um, in a museum in London, or um, I think it's the original uh, that was restored, um, but there are a lot of people who have reconstructed it. It's an analog computer, not for general computation, but for specifically just calculating derivatives. And in fact, there's interest in, there was interest in analog, in analog computers for calculating derivatives uh, well into the 20th century, to the point that if if you've read, if you've read um, structure and interpretation of computer programs, when they're teaching you um, to calculate integrals, they point out how because this uses recursion, we couldn't implement this uh, with a circuit, um, with an analog circuit. And uh, so it's that late that you know, if you were writing a book in the 80s, you could remember a time period where people were building analog computers to, to calculate derivatives. Um, but 
still, it, it remains a, a, a bit troubling. I think that, you know, it, we, a, differentiation is a operation that we apply to mathematical functions, to, to analytic functions in particular, right? Um, but differentiation itself is not an analytic function, right? It can't be represented as uh, f of x equals um, uh, whatever. Um, uh, so um, that's, a, you know, um, a, a, a little bit troubling, and it played, you know, logicians for some period um, until the lambda calculus. So um, this is actually a quote, uh, and much of this, uh, this research today that I'm presenting in largely chronological order, I, I was basically like pulling a thread for me when I got interested in, in working on uh, AD techniques myself, and I, that, in that I knew of a few papers, largely, uh, you know, for more recent ones, and uh, then I, I learned that there was like a long history of it. And so this is a quote that I found in a paper from the early 20th century, Lonzo Church from 1941, describing that when he thought that uh, of that he the the lambda calculus was something that um, would allow you to pass a function to a function and creating higher order functions, the first thing that he thought of was differentiation was that this allowed you to encode differentiation as a function and something that, that meets the mathematical definition of a function, that it, 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 um, uh, it sends values in a domain to values in a code domain, um, and, and where they, to only one value in a code domain, unlike, say, um, uh, inverse uh, like, uh, tangent or something, or we have to restrict it. Um, so uh, um, that's, you know, it, 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 it the starting, I hope you're starting to see uh, why that simple definition might not be a coincidence that it works. Um, and to really get there, so this is obviously we know in 1958, John McCarthy uh, based Lisp on Church's, um, Church's untyped lambda calculus. And um, uh, he actually demonstrated it in 1959 uh, during a very informal talk at MIT. Um, and you can actually read a description of this on uh, uh, one of Paul Graham's very uh, many essays, um, uh, 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 which I obviously told him secondhand. Um, and uh, so he started out building, you know, with basic list processing functions, very few primitives, um, and you know the metacircular value that we we see. If you were here last month, you saw Will Bird uh, talk extensively about, and then built up to higher order functions in the course of an hour. And what did he use for his demonstration at the end? Uh, a, pro, a very simple program for mul for differentiating univariate um, polynomials. So. Um, and then for going further with this, in 1970, Fred McBride, who I only know as the father of Connor McBride, who we'll see again in a few minutes, he had created a dialectic list with pattern matching. Um, I don't know if this is, uh, has had to do with the fact that in 1970, I immediately think that's when ML came out. Um, and a few years later, Prologue, there was a lot of interest in unification. So I, I, that could be a topic of someone else's talk about um, where did pattern matching really come from, that people, you know, integrated into a bunch of languages all at the same time. But um, in his dissertation, like McCarthy, what did he use to demonstrate this? It just happened to be differentiation. And if you look at this program here, um, this looks a lot to me like uh, 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 the definition of, of uh, a function for differentiation in Haskell, um, which we'll, we'll see actually a, a few slides forward. Um, so um, it, it's a little bit tough to see, but that's, to me it looks almost exactly. Um, and uh, to show that I'm not just, uh, really not just bullshitting you about this, um, one of my truly favorite papers on this subject, maybe favorite papers in general, Calculus and Co-Inductive Form by two mathematicians, uh, Pavlovich and Escardo, um, 1998, they actually uh, use category theory to prove that this is isomorphic, right? So it, it, it's not just uh, that you can do this because Church, you know, thought of it and, and we have, and, and functional languages are based on the lambda calculus, but they actually, they actually prove the isomorphism and uh, I, I'm not a mathematician, so I'm not gonna pull out a whiteboard and try to demonstrate this to you here. I'd, I, we don't have the time and I would probably make a mistake, but um, this is their commuting square for the Taylor series, so what we just saw. And um, it, you, you can see um, at, the, at the bottom, you have list processing, head to tail operations, and at the top, um, differentiation and it, and isomorphism right here on, on each side, right? So um, you can check this commutes. Um, and and this, it doesn't use really incredibly advanced category theory. If you say been programming in Haskell for a year, you could understand this paper uh, if, if you go and read it. Um, so I um, highly recommend that. Um, as a, a little bit of a side, um, uh, the, the 
Um, in, in 1964, uh, a fellow, uh, Robert N. A a Edwin Wengert, uh, published his dissertation on automatic differentiation. And to be honest, I know absolutely nothing about uh, this person. Um, I'm only mentioning it because as a survey talk, uh, this is uh, apparently the first time that the term automatic differentiation was ever uh, brought up in the literature. And um, uh, so felt uh, necessary for inclusion, but also um, th th there's a lot of uh, claims to who had the first dissertation in the field of computer science in in, in uh, ever, right? Because um, you know a whole generation of computer scientists that we all look up to, um, they were all trained as mathematicians or physicists often, um, and um, it would be also another. Uh, interesting uh, subject for someone to, to, to look into. How did computer science actually arise as a field, right? Um, and uh, so there are many different people who claim on the internet, oh, this paper was the first dissertation in the field of computer science for someone who's awarded a PhD in that field. Um, and uh, this is one of those claims. I, I can't say if it's the first, but it's one of them. And so I think, you know, if uh, it, the, the, the fact that one of the first dissertations in this field was on automatic differentiation, just like McCarthy chose to use that among all, all possible things he could have to, to, to demonstrate LISP, um, that really says something. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I, I am uh, really slanting this talk, uh, biasing it towards functional programming, because that's a lot of, you know, my background, and also for a long period of time, uh, that's where a lot of the most interesting, I think, theoretical work on AD has occurred. But um, it, it's not something that's specific to functional programming at all. Um, and in fact, uh, around the time when uh, that dissertation, uh, Wengert's dissertation would have been published, um, it, it kind of uh, it had its heyday. Um, and there, there's a website that's, that's uh, compiled by a national laboratory in France, autodiff.org, where you can see the numerous Fortran and C++ uh, um, libraries that implement AD. Um, so it, it's certainly something that people um, in the HPC world are really um, thinking about. Um, and, but it seems like it was largely abandoned in favor of you know, numerical methods, like we mentioned earlier, approximation, especially a lot with the advent of GPUs, and even before that, just the Moore's Law and the economy of scale on that. Um, uh, it became possible to do those things uh, very quickly. Um, but for, so we'll see at the end how it kind of came back into the, the, the uh, mainstream of numerical computing. But for, for a long period of time, it, it was uh, kind of this, this trick in the functional programming ghetto. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, sort of going to skip this, but basically, as we saw before, when they said co-inductive form, that means lazy, that, that means infinite less, right? So it, 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 as we'll see in the Haskell uh, interpretation, it, it's really a good fit for for lazy evaluation. I'm not going to explain what lazy evaluation is for for times uh, for time's sake, but. Um, uh, um, it's important to note in, in this quote that Philip Wadler in 1992, uh, one of the um, developers of Haskell initially, um, uh, pointed out that like lazy lists, how would you implement lazy lists in, in an impure or an imperative language? And, and he thought, well, probably through some kind of coroutines. And that's actually not a coincidence. Um, so the, the, the paper that I really point to as the kind of germ for all the, the functional approaches that, 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 that we've seen is by Gilles Kahn and David McQueen in 1977. and um, it, it was unpublished. Jules Kahn died fairly early, um, and David McQueen is still contributes to Standard ML of New Jersey. Um, but it, it, it's quickly spread throughout the functional programming world by word, word of mouth. Um, and the paper actually only mentions uh, AD in the conclusion. It largely focuses on uh, the sieve of Aristophanes for generating prime numbers. Uh, and there's a lot of debate over whether it's the actual prime sieve that Aristophanes used in, uh, in, in uh, some, uh, uh, I think, the second century BC in Egypt. Uh, but uh, so some people will just refer to this as the prime sieve. But um, uh, so mainly the point being the code was left out and, and the paper wasn't uh, published till much later. Um, but this is where um, uh, Gerald Sussman and Harold Abelson uh, 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 learned this technique to include in the structure and interpretation of computer programs. When it gets to the chapter, the third chapter, where they're explaining lazy evaluation, they use the, what have become the two canonical examples of it, the prime sieve and generating formal power series. Um, later in 1999, uh, Jerry Sussman actually uh, published Structure and Interpretation of Classical Mechanics um, to try to teach uh, classical, classical mechanics uh, to MIT students using Scheme and uh, published a SICM utils package, which is more in-depth uh, AD as well as uh, um, other numerical methods. Um, but then, so, so, so another person whose eye uh, uh, this caught was Doug McElroy, 
who's at the time the head of the division at Bell Labs that Unix and C came out of. Now, he was actually present at uh, the Mar McCarthy's original demo in 1959, um, and uh, it, it had himself programmed a coroutine-based implementation of, implementation of prime sieves in 1968. Um, in fact, we only know about, or I only know about that, um, uh, that, that McCarthy's, McCarthy's demo because he was the one who told Paul Graham about it, um, it for, to write that essay. Um, and McElroy is best known for adding uh, pipelines to Unix. Uh, it, uh, it's best known technical innovation, and that what's what enabled the new Unix philosophy. So um, we're often told by Alan Kay and, and uh, Richard Gabriel and a lot of common Lisp people that there's a stark division between Lisp and functional programming and Unix and C. Uh, but actually, uh, the, the Unix, the essence of it, really isn't the kernel. It's the it's the shell. That's what forms of what people refer to as the Unix philosophy. You have many small, pro well, not necessarily small in implementation but programs that do one thing very well, and then we can compose them together using common interface text streams, right? And we compose them using pipelines. And uh, standard I.O. is a big invention. Before that, you wanted to plug in a keyboard and, and use it with C. It was like working with an Arduino. Um, so standard I.O. is fundamentally lazy, right? You wouldn't want to have to read all of your input from a source before you started computation. Of course, this is what DOS did, and that was... Uh, many people point out it was a big error with DOS, among other things. Um, and uh, uh, Oleg uh, Kiselyov, if you're in the Haskell or OCaml world, you must be surely familiar with, went as far as to point out that Unix pipes are very similar to IO monads in terms of dealing with effectful computation in a, a lazy manner. Um, and McElroy, uh, he spent some time in Oxford, actually, around the time he wrote that Prime Sieve, uh, to try to learn some theory behind what they were working on at Bell Labs. And um, so it's no surprise that he would later describe uh, his work with that in terms of Tony Hoare's uh, um, concurrency model communicating sequential processes, uh, which was, wasn't published until 1978 and later in a book form in 1985. Um, most of the work at Bell Labs in the 80s um, was uh, devoted towards concurrency. Rob Pike, uh, who you know is now at Google and invented Go, right? Um, we had a numerous CSP languages that are sort of predecessors to Go, and then of course Plan 9, the operating system that's meant for distributed computation. Um, one of those was called News Squeak, and it's called that because it, it's a it's a CSP-based concurrent um, version of the Squeak dialect of Smalltalk, and um, uh, this provided the medium for McElroy's first attempt at implementing Kanye routines. Uh, a coroutine-based AD program, um, which, of course, there wasn't code for. And he published this in a 1989 paper, Squinting at Power Series. This is a diagram from that paper of uh, multiplication, uh, the Cauchy product, if we're talking about um, infinite series, or um, uh, say the binomial theorem, if you're talking about uh, finite poly polynomials. And you could see that it's recursive. It doesn't go more, it doesn't recurse more beyond one level in the diagram, right? But you could see a little version of itself there. And all these lines here are channels, just like, you, like, like you'd, be, you'd see channels in Go if you've ever used Golang. Um, and, and, um, uh, to me, you know, uh, Alan Kay describes looking at uh, that uh, the metacircular evaluator in Lisp as uh, Maxwell's equations for software. To me, I had the same feeling when I first saw this. After having programmed this numerous times, when I saw this there um, as a diagram form, I really, I, I, I really felt that. Um, so um, the conclude. So. Um, and uh, you know, moving on, uh, 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 McElroy actually, uh, when he retired, and he's now at Dartmouth, um, he started working in Haskell, and 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 he implemented this this the same uh, AD package in Haskell, and published two papers on it. One with the first one in 1998, and it consists of just 17 one-liners with the type signatures omitted. This is the program that we saw at the beginning here, right? Uh, he described this as the most beautiful code I've ever written, and. Um, I sort of agree. I mean, to me, this is really on par with uh, the metacircular evaluator we saw last month. Um, so the conclusion of this, if you ever read Worse is Better by Richard Gabriel, um, it's bullshit. So that's, the, that's one of the arguments I want to make here, is that there is not a division, a stark division between Unix and C and Lisp and functional programming. They're very much uh, coming out of the same thing. And the, people's, the people actually involved in them in the 70s didn't see it that way. I mean, there were maybe some interpersonal issues, but uh, they're very much conceptually related. Um, 
Moving on though to actually like current uh, uh, research that forms like how we work with this today, there's there's a, a very prolific uh, a researcher, Jerzy Karmazak, a, a Polish French researcher, um, who a year before McElroy's uh, Haskell version wrote his own one, and this is basically the basis for all the the, the current uh, Haskell versions that we see. So he focused on finite polynomials, um, and eventually uh, going on to multivariate ones. He coined the term lazy tower uh, of derivatives for how. Uh, you have you know a lazy list of the first derivative, the second derivative, et cetera, going on, on and on. And he used dual numbers, so uh, tuples of doubles, where one represents the value uh, of the function at a given point, and one represents the value of a particular derivative of, of it at a certain point. So that was the primitive that he's working with. Um, and he also was primarily interested in generating Haskell functions rather than just um, uh, just uh, the functions in data form, like with elided variables, like you'd put them in, like as uh, say a list or or a, ne or a nested list, if you're interested in sparse form, um, which allowed him to use the uh, the built-in functional composition operator that dot in Haskell. Um, and he, he the the paper uh, that he did uh, he first uh, presented that in generating power of lazy semantics has became a classic in the field. He published numerous others uh, uh, during a v relatively short period of time, many more than I list right here. Um, going to some, some technical things um, that arose sort of around that time, you're, there are three kind of modes that people talk about in AD. There's forward mode, reverse mode, and or adjoint mode, and mixed mode. Forward mode is what we've already seen, and it's pretty much the, the typical uh, um, thing that you learned in, when doing calculus by hand, right? Application of the chain rule goes from right to left. If you think about it in terms of fu the functional composition, then we're going from inside to outside. So straightforward, uh, both to think about and, and to program. So not much to say about that. Reverse mode, though, is the really counterintuitive one in terms of, uh, if you think about it in terms of traditional calculus. The chain rule goes from right to left, and composition goes from outside to inside, which is quite odd, because you have to generate the, the functions beforehand and then go back and differentiate them. And so uh, for these reasons, it's actually, it's much more difficult to implement. But we're, why are we interested in it? Well, it's extremely useful for a lot of al applications, as we'll, as we'll see in just a couple minutes, uh, machine learning really in particular. Um, mixed mode, pretty much what it sounds like. It's a combination of the two. We're not really going to talk about that. Um, and so the, the, the data-driven approach, um, uh, I have some feelings about that because that's sort of like where my own research goes, but that's pretty much what we saw from McElroy. Um, then there's approach of, of, like I said, with Carter Marjak was focused on generating functions. Um, and uh, um, this is, there are also imperative implementations of this. Um, uh, the, so the, the first way that people thought to this was using operator overloading, like we saw. Um, so that, that, was, that was his method. Also, uh, imperative method, so there's a C++ package called fad bad plus plus. I don't know how they chose that to be the best name. Um, uh, if you want to see a paper that really presents this in, I think, a, a way that's really um, uh, easy to understand, uh, Connell Elliott um, uh, released a Haskell, pa a Haskell package around 2009 and wrote a paper on it, Beautiful Differentiation, as well as, well as a series of blog posts that are great um, uh, to read if, if you want an understanding of it. Uh, the upside compared to the data-driven approach is it allows use of built-in functional composition uh, for applying the chain rule. Um, which is very uh, very important if you want to basically do anything of practical significance. The downside um, is that it has uh, problems of, of confusing levels, right? So, um, so let's say we we even with ar arithmetic operators, if we overload a multiplication to be the Cauchy product or, or, or the binomial theorem, then you can't multiply the first and second derivative. There are different semantic levels that they mean different things. So this was later referred to as perturbation confusion or confusion of infinitesimals. Um, because that's what it would mean in standard notation, like you would learn in high school. Um, and it makes reverse mode very difficult. So in Haskell, you're doing a lot of lifting um, in order to, to, to make sure it's correct. In fact, the current Haskell package that, that, that everyone uses, which takes a really kitchen sink approach and every possible style of AD you'd want, is Edward Komet's AD library. Um, it started as basically a challenge to himself to answer a stack overflow question about how would you implement reverse mode in Haskell. Um, the next thing that follows from that improvement on, on those downsides is source generation. So um, using some form of compile time metaprogramming, so for like for example like template Haskell, um, to generate the uh, the derivative functions on the fly, right? So it solves the problem of uh, confusing um, level semantic levels and operator overloading, um, and it's also what's used in several of the extremely uh, fast Fortran packages that you could um, you find out there, and uh, more recently in diff sharp. And so this is maybe. Uh, 
the most performant uh, functional package you'll find. Um, and it uses uh, quotation evaluators, which are F sharp's form of uh, compile time metaprogramming. And I, I, I think, I, I wondered for a while why, why F sharp. Um, and I, I don't think it's because it's not, it doesn't enforce purity, but it's because uh, they, they're enable, they, they can take advantage of, of .NET's link framework uh, that Eric Meyer developed um, for incremental compilation. Right, um, which, which allows them to do to generate these derivatives on the fly uh, very quickly. Um, so, um, the, who I would say by, are by far the two most prolific researchers in ADR: Jeffrey Siskin and Brock Perlmutter. Siskin's at uh, Purdue Computer Science. Perlmutter uh, runs a AI lab at a, a university in Ireland. Um, um, uh, they mainly uh, have worked in Scheme and Haskell, but also uh, um, contributed to, to Diff Sharp that I just ta talked about, and um, a Lisp dialect uh, that uses ADs as primitives. So they were the first ones to point out the problem of perturbation confusion in this other seminal paper right here, um, uh, analyzing both Karmajic's Haskell approach and um, uh, Jerry Sussman's approach in Scheme. Um, and probably maybe two dozen papers between them that they were authors or co-authors of. So this is just a very small um, uh, uh, sampling of, and you can look at my references uh, um, for the talk to read them. Um, Derivatives, derivatives of types, I'm sort of going to skip over this because uh, the seminal paper, Connor McBride's The Derivative of a Regular Type is its one, is, is, is the, the type of its of its one whole context. I think I might have made a typo there. Um, this was, was presented uh, very well at Papers We Loved last year. So I recommend you look it up on YouTube. It's pretty complicated for me to describe right here. But um, uh, it, it's, it's important going forward because um, even 2001, the differential lambda calculus, and this builds on mixed brides work, um, uh, but basically developing a version of the lambda calculus that has AD built into it um, using linear logic, which is even more complicated than um, dependent types. Um, and uh, the best I can explain it uh, sort of crudely is that um, it extends the Taylor formula, the idea that you can, you can calculate derivatives um, uh, by um, using the Taylor series of functions and composing them to bound variables in lambda terms. So if you think of stacking lambdas together and each bound variable is a different term in a Taylor series, or in terms of the typed uh, differential lambda calculi, um, you could think of them as sort of like, like curried, like in, in, inputs to curried functions like you'd see in a type signature to Haskell as being terms in a Taylor series. So. Um, I'm not going to go beyond this much, but uh, basically that the end result of it, and you could really just read the paper, uh, you don't have to know the linear logic to understand it, is that, that the reduction rules in the lambda calculus apply to differentiation um, completely. So ch the chain rule is literally just beta reduction. That's sort of the punchline as I see it. Um, and uh, so that really reinforces that those isomorphisms that we saw in uh, um, the Pavlovich and Escardo paper where those commuting squares it really reinforces it by actually implementing it in a form of the lambda calculus. Now, um, in other words, this is what Church was really, plan really planning originally. Now, um, this might seem highly theoretic, but it was actually um, uh, it, it, it was actually implemented in a uh, in, in a, uh, a scheme interpreter called Stalingrad for a dialect called Vlad. If you've ever read. Look, if you've read, ever read any papers by the two of these, you'd understand kind of their, um, their why, why they would name things so peculiarly. Um, but uh, that basically, uh, it, essentially, it's nothing more. It's an, implement, an implementation of the differential lambda calculus. So it has, uh, uh, it's a purely functional language with built-in AD operators, and um, uh, which allows it to be very fast. That's the, that's the punchline of that. So here are benchmarks they ran. Uh, basically using a minimax of a saddle curve and a particle simulation using Euler's equations. Um, and they showed that it, it's basically three to five times roughly faster than the fastest Fortran packages that use source generation and 50 times faster than the fastest C++ uh, 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 packages that use operator overloading, about 250 times faster than, than the Haskell uh, ones like, like Edward Komet's that we, we, we have mainly saw. Um, and I don't even want to get into the, their comparison to other scheme packages because it gets to be quite uh, embarrassing. Um, and I don't know how much they fudge these benchmarks as we tend to do. Um, but so uh, to close up, um, AD is becoming popular again. So this is, and, and, and it's in the mainstream. And why? 
Backpropagation is just the chain rule. So everyone and their mother is doing machine learning now. Your grandmother probably has TensorFlow installed and, and is trying to like train it on, on her like her crocheting or something. Uh, but uh, so it, it's it's very good if you're if you're an AD research re researcher that it, ha it just so happens that reverse mode AD is exactly what you need to back propagate errors through a, um, a, a, a re recurrent neural network and. Um, so a lot of tools have developed around this, but uh, the paper that's currently uh, um, uh, really capturing my interest and really drives this home is that DeepMind demonstrated in 2015 using differentiable data structures, so similarly baked into data structures like we just saw um, differential differentiation operators baked into a language, um, the training just a basic uh, uh, long short-term memory recurrent neural network, they could achieve the same results with one pass through as with four passes through using approximation. So you, you can this, you could sort of see like how uh, the interest is in. And they've of, co of course moved on to differential neural computers that they're building in hardware now. Um, and finally, uh, uh, it's not just in, in machine learning. There's interest really for anyone who's working with stochastic processes, um, uh, largely in finance. In 2004, uh, there's a paper. Um, that uh, just started by calculating Greeks and built up to um, uh, uh, um, using the LIBOR market model using automatic differentiation, and so achieving exact results for that. And then a, a survey paper in 2011, uh, um, based on all these for it. And, and finally, uh, not not just in, in a hard uh, a hard science like you know financial modeling, but in the social sciences uh, at Columbia University, they're developing a probabilistic programming language uh, called STAN. Uh, and that has an AD implementation in C++. So um, I hope uh, I've given you a sense of what AD is, the history of it, and um, why you should be interested in it now, and why you might be hearing more about it now. So.